Have you ever taken such why a in the hell did you Why did you leave them to the body? They're, they're still walking. Can you explain to me why? Well, then what was I'm asking. asking. Explain this. The fifth estate. Tonight. It was the most shocking atrocity story about Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. They took the babies out of the incubators. They took the incubators and left the children to die on the cold floor. But was it true? Two weeks after the liberation, it became apparent that the story was a complete hoax. Lyndon McIntyre exposes the big lie of the Gulf crisis and the massive public relations campaign that whipped up war fever in the United States. Good evening, I'm Lyndon McIntyre. A year ago tonight, the United States was just a week away from launching a massive military assault on Iraq. It was to be the culmination of a five-month-long political effort to liberate Kuwait from the iron grip of Saddam Hussein's invasion and occupation. Americans supported the move to war, outraged in no small part by reports of atrocities by Iraqi troops in Kuwait. The Fifth Estate has investigated the most notorious atrocity story that Saddam's soldiers ripped babies from incubators and left them to die. The identity of a key witness to that story provides a disturbing insight into a multi-million dollar propaganda campaign to sell a war. The morning of January 17th came early to Baghdad. The liberation of Kuwait has begun. Getting ready to go wherever they tell us to go. There were troops and hardware from 32 countries, but Americans led the way, finally ending a debate about whether or not economic sanctions would be enough to drive Saddam back to Iraq. Everybody supports the armed forces there, and 80, 90 percent probably support what President Bush has done. In previous August, Saddam's army virtually destroyed the economy of his rich but tiny neighbor. His soldiers looted and burned as they rolled through Kuwait, almost unopposed. But Americans were unmoved and unwilling to take on another faraway war against battle-hardened fanatics. Very few Americans knew what Kuwait was when the invasion took place, and the odds are they didn't care much that Iraq had invaded Kuwait. Uh, they probably couldn't even find it on a map for the most part. Americans are famously ignorant of geography. So this war very much had to be sold to the American people in order to convince them to intervene militarily. The selling job started early enough and honestly as terrified Kuwaitis fled into neighboring Saudi Arabia. There were scores of personal accounts of suffering, but one story in particular confirmed the callous brutality of the invaders. They stole the incubators and threw the babies out of the incubators. 22 newborn babies were in incubators at Adan Hospital, and the troops, the Iraqi troops, turned off the oxygen of those incubators. The story was reported and repeated, and even without confirming evidence, became part of the case for a war in response to Saddam's aggression. Then in Washington, before the Congressional Human Rights Caucus, co-chairman John Porter of Illinois and Thomas Lantis of California presented the first eyewitness to the incubator report. She was a 15-year-old schoolgirl, and her story shocked an audience that extended far beyond the hearing room. While I was there, I saw the Iraqi soldiers come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of the incubators. took the incubators and left the children to die on the cold floor. Her story put a pitiful human face on testimony from the Kuwaiti ambassador who spoke to the Human Rights Caucus earlier that day, Nasir al-Sabah. The Human Rights Caucus, uh, led by Congressman Lantus and Congressman Porter, were, were very instrumental on this. They were deeply touched by what they heard. They were deeply touched when everyone, I think, in the country was deeply touched. Uh, what they saw and heard from the, those hearings.
U.S. Congress held a highly emotional hearing today on atrocities in Kuwait. Newscasts crackled with the story. ...brutality taken from their mothers, and a 15-year-old girl afraid to use her real name in case of reprisals against her family in Kuwait. It was a, uh, the first time, I think, when the American people were focused on what was happening to the Kuwaiti citizens at the hands of the Iraqi soldiers. Human Rights Caucus co-chairman John Porter, who was a Republican, had some quick feedback from one important member of the audience. I got uh, feedback from the president. Uh, I happened to be over at the White House the afternoon, uh, uh, later in the evening, after the afternoon of the hearings, and the president said that he had uh, seen it on uh, CNN and that uh, he was shocked at some of the things that he had heard. They had people on... on the president on repeated the incubator story six times in his verbal war against Saddam. Dead, and they had kids in incubators, and they were thrown out of the incubators so that Kuwait could be systematically dismantled. Daylight brings only the digging of yet more graves. His body Soon there were reports of mass burials of premature babies in Kuwait, dumped from incubators which were then trucked to Baghdad. The Iraqis tore the respirators from their incubators. We had to bury many of people. And the story didn't just have an impact in the U.S. The United Nations convened a rare public forum. The hardest thing was burying their babies. I myself buried 14 newborn babies that had been taken from their incubators by the soldiers. Will those in favor In a vote two days later, the UN approved the use of force against Iraq. Within days of the UN session, a report on Kuwait by Amnesty International quoted Nayira's testimony to the U.S. congressman, and they put a number on the infant deaths, 312. Meanwhile, the U.S. Congress was preparing to authorize military force. Just that now is the time to check the aggression of this ruthless dictator whose troops have bayoneted pregnant women and have ripped babies from their incubators in Kuwait. The House easily approved a war resolution. Then it was up to the Senate. To authorize the use of United States armed forces pursuant to United States... In the States debate, Security the incubator Council story came up seven yet. times. Mr. Dole, aye. Mr. Domenici, aye. Mr. In the end, the war resolution only passed by five votes. The U.S. decision to wage war against Iraq was supported by an overwhelming civilian consensus. The heart of that consensus was the belief that Saddam Hussein was evil incarnate. And there was no shortage of evidence for that belief. The savagery of his attack on Kuwait was consistent with his behavior at home. There should have been no need for invented atrocity stories. But as evidence from independent investigators now shows, that's exactly what the U.S. people and the whole world got. Dr. David Chu is a biomedical engineer at British Columbia Institute of Technology. He was assigned by the World Health Organization to go to Kuwait last May to assess the damage to medical equipment. He visited all facilities from operating rooms to maternity wards, expecting a lot more damage than he found. I felt I was lied to. I was quite surprised to see the large number of infant incubators there. So I asked the uh, person uh, who was guiding us what happened, whether the story we were told was true or not, is that the taking of incubators away had not occurred. Dr. Ian Pollock took pictures too, investigating the incubator story for London-based Physicians for Human Rights. The suggestion 312 babies died when incubators were stolen was wrong. I don't think there were anything like that number of babies who would have been in incubators and dependent on them. The number is far too great. In one situation, I found a pediatrician who was willing to tell me off the record that he knew of this story. He also felt it was not true, but also felt that it was being spread by some people for their own reasons. as if you like, uh, misinformation. A lot of people have said that this was part of a uh, disinformation uh, program. 
Though Amnesty International first reported the 312 figure, they soon retreated from the early details and now deny the entire incubator story. Spokesman Sean Stiles in London. We spoke to um, well over a dozen doctors of different nationalities uh, who had been in Kuwait at the time and they couldn't stand the story up and it became quite clear to us uh, that credible medical opinion was that this didn't happen. Officials of Middle East Watch, which also monitors human rights, were suspicious from the start. Executive Director Andrew Whitley of New York was part of a two-man investigation in Kuwait and he doesn't mince words describing the incubator story. Soon after we arrived in Kuwait, um, two weeks after the liberation, it became apparent that the story was a complete hoax. We were able to go round the hospitals to count the incubators and find that, uh, possibly with one or two that had been misplaced, that none were missing. So none of the incubators were removed in the first place. Moreover, it seemed quite clear that there weren't any deaths which had been deliberately the cause of the Iraqis having gone in and stolen equipment. So how did a story that was essentially untrue become an element in a consensus that sent hundreds of thousands of American and Allied troops into a regional conflict that might have been settled by other means? Well, the answer to that question lies in a process that's as American as Pepsi-Cola. It's about your scholarship. You heard? We were looking for a little better outside shooter. You're the Pepsi generation. But Hamilton. Anybody who thinks advertising is a hit or miss business has been asleep for 40 years. What you're looking at is a device for measuring the impact of an ad on a target audience. The monitor records the sensory impact of the images, and if it sells Pepsi, it'll also sell a precedent and his message. This morning I'm also grateful to have this. The company that monitored Pepsi ads also monitored the effectiveness of key players in the war of words that led up to the shooting war in the Gulf last year. D. Alsop of the Worthland Group in Washington picks response groups to rate sales pitches. We give them each a little device. It's about the size of their hand in which they can say whether or not they're reacting favorably or unfavorably to what's being said. And across the screen is a line that goes up and down depending on whether Americans are agreeing with what the president's saying or disagreeing. And we use that to identify the messages that really resonate emotionally uh, with the American people. In the fall of 1990, Alsop did polling as part of a massive public relations campaign paid for by Citizens for a Free Kuwait, a temporary coalition of Kuwaiti citizens and government officials. The entire effort, I think, came up to over $10 million, which is about what it is for a presidential campaign. Citizens for a Free Kuwait wanted to get public opinion behind a full-scale commitment to liberate their country. So they paid $10.7 million to America's biggest public relations company, Hill and Knowlton, Inc. For me, fill me with sadness. Hill and Knowlton refused to talk about the campaign, but they've provided a vivid visual record of it. Events and rallies they organized and recorded and distributed to the news media. But early on, their daily polling showed most ordinary Americans didn't care about Kuwait. And so the efforts were, what is it that we can do to emotionally motivate people to support actions through the UN or otherwise to drive them out? And the emotional things that would do that was the fact that Saddam Hussein was a madman who had committed atrocities even against his own people and had tremendous power to do further damage and he needed to be stopped. And so the hearings on Capitol Hill on human rights violations and uh, the hearings that were unprecedented in, in, precedented in the United Nations uh, along the same lines where there were actual pictures and things of the atrocities that were and the destruction of their country. Uh, those were big, big events. The video news release, the high-tech PR blurb, 
Hill and Knowlton generated an audio-video feast of images for the media. And one of the most compelling was Naira. I could not help but think of my nephew, who, if born premature, might have died that day as well. She seemed to be alone before the Congressional Human Rights Caucus, identified only as a Kuwaiti escapee. But we've discovered she wasn't alone at all. And she wasn't just a simple Kuwaiti escapee. In fact, just a few seats away was her father, Kuwait's ambassador to the United States and Canada. Naira quickly slipped out of the caucus hearing, back into the protective folds of her family, the extended royal family of Kuwait, headed by the emir, Jabir al-Sabah. I have to ask why she was not identified as your daughter when she gave that testimony to the uh, House Committee, or the House Caucus. Well, for security reasons, I didn't believe it was uh, uh, just for, to, for her safety. Did uh, the Human Rights Caucus members and the chair p people know who she was? Yes, of course they, they knew her identity. They knew her identity and they knew exactly what, uh, what the girl was telling them was the truth. How many people knew that she was the ambassador's daughter? I didn't. I don't know who, who knew. Uh, I, I did not know she was the ambassador's daughter. When did you find out she was the ambassador's daughter? Uh, not, uh, uh, this is the first allegation I've had that she was the ambassador's daughter. Does it affect her credibility in your mind? I think uh, it certainly should have been known uh, at the time of the hearing. Uh, it would have had bearing on what uh, she might have said, yes. I think people, members of Congress certainly, and members of the public uh, were entitled to know uh, uh, the source of, of uh, her testimony, therefore who she was. If it became known that um, it was somebody who was closely associated with obviously putting across a Kuwaiti government position at a particular time when public opinion was very sensitively balanced in the United States at least about whether or not one should be going to war, it was, it was an evenly balanced issue, then it could well have tipped the balance one way that, that this was an entire show that was being arranged. Whether she was my daughter, my friend, or she was somebody else, I could much more easily, if I wanted to lie, or if we wanted to lie, or we wanted to exaggerate, I wouldn't use uh, my daughter to do so. I could easily buy other people to do it. Did you think it would affect her credibility if people knew that, that she was your daughter, that she was part of the... I had no Kuwaiti. problem with credibility, Mr. Akintar. I think the girl came voluntarily and spoke and told them what she actually saw with her own eyes. That wasn't just one person. There were a series of people who saw this whole thing happening. When we went back to Kuwait and we, were, we, we interviewed many of the people who were there, they all, all the testimony corroborated each, each other. They all saw the same thing. There weren't any incubators left behind in Kuwait anyway. We had to buy everything now the, and ship it. Now, some of the human rights groups that, that raised this in the first place, notably Amnesty, mm -hmm. Middle East Watch, say that they went back there, they, they, when they investigated on the ground, first of all, all the incubators were accounted for, there was no incubators gone, and then secondly, they could, the only person who, had, who could claim to be an eyewitness to the atrocity was your daughter. I'm sorry about their report, but what they saw is the new ones we bought, because we bought them, and we had them airlifted to Kuwait immediately after liberation. So it's a very interesting story. <laughs> it's a pediatrician, I mean, Ian Pollock. <laughs> it's an absurdity that the, the, the amount of, I mean, w as we left on the third week, they still weren't getting water and food in properly, let alone uh, medical supply. I mean, it was the place, the organization was very, very poor. Dr. David Chu found there was equipment missing from Kuwait hospitals, things like dentists' chairs, and very little had been replaced, especially not incubators, because they were never taken in the first place. When I asked the engineer, one of the engineers, about the story, and he told me that uh, they should not have had such a story because if the world had known about it later on, it would have come back to haunt them. These are some of the controversial incubators. When the Iraqi occupiers heard the story that they'd stolen them and killed babies in the process, they invited journalists into Kuwait hospitals to see for themselves. But the story persisted until independent investigators arrived on the scene. 
Then the picture started changing. The doctor who gave Amnesty the information that 312 babies died revised the number down to 72. It finally settled at 30, of which 19 died before the Iraqis arrived. The story evaporated. The number of people who you could find who had seen premature babies who had died unnecessarily was zero. That was horrifying. But what of Naira's story, that as a volunteer in one of the hospitals, she saw the atrocity. Would you let us talk to the one eyewitness we've been able to find, who's your daughter? Would you let her tell her story to us about what she saw? I believe there is no reason why she told it to the whole world. So what she has told the whole world, I think there is no reason why she would be telling you. I mean, part of the whole uh, system. But what the world didn't know at the time was that the witnesses appearing before the Congressional Human Rights Caucus that day were carefully coached by Hill and Knowlton. There was training with these individuals to help them get more comfortable with the setting, the circumstances, the questions, so that they could focus on their story. You know, that was clearly one of the roles that, uh, that Hill and Knowlton was able to help them with. A cynic might suspect that a $10 million public relations campaign conducted by a major, sophisticated agency like Hill and Knowlton may have led uh, to some excesses bordering on disinformation. Oh, that's, um, I think, an exaggeration of, of the views here. There wasn't a public relations media drive to, to uh, win the, the uh, emotions of the world with the Kuwaiti people because the facts spoke for themselves. Why was it necessary to, to spend $10 million? Who spent $10 million? I don't the know, you've been trying to drive citizens, this point. Well, no, it's, it's on the record. Citizens for Free Kuwait well, if, paid if, that much money to Hill and Knowlton in a period of five or six months. Well, if they paid um, that much money to a public relations firm because they are concerned citizens who are, happen to be in this country when the invasion took place, and they need people to help them. But we didn't need to do so as a government, as an embassy. But Hill and Knowlton documents disclose that the Committee for a Free Kuwait includes members of the Kuwaiti government. And the PR firm provided services to the ambassador himself, including daily assessments of his public performances and image. And as the weeks went by, even his appearance changed. Now this is the situation we're facing is, how are we going to put an end to this? So we would get uh, like the Kuwaiti ambassador and things that he would say and we would be able to go back to him the next day and say out of, the, out of your uh, 30 things that you said in a half hour speech, here are the three things that work really well, that really hit a responsive chord in the American public. It's terrifyingly effective public relations and a fantastic, incredible subversion of democracy. When you begin allowing public relations firms to set the agenda, to make the decision on whether, in a sense, in a sense to, to organize the debate about whether, whether or not we're going to go to war. That's the view of John Richard MacArthur, publisher of Harper's Magazine. He's investigated the role of propaganda in selling the Gulf War, and he's written a book about it coming out this spring. He's also explored the impact of that congressional hearing and a startling conflict of interest at the highest level. The at the time, Congressman Porter and Lantus chaired the hearing on Kuwait. They also headed a private group, the Congressional Human Rights Foundation. MacArthur discovered a disturbing link between the Human Rights Foundation and the PR firm that was selling the war. The Congressional Human Rights Foundation literally operates out of Hill and Knowlton's offices uh, on the second floor of a, 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 an office complex called Washington Harbor in Georgetown. Hill and Knowlton provides a $3,000 in-kind charitable contribution to the Congressional Human Rights Foundation in the form of a rent reduction for the office space. The link between Hill and Knowlton and the Human Rights Foundation doesn't end there. Frank Mankiewicz, vice chairman of Hill and Knowlton, became a director of the Human Rights Foundation. And there are other interconnections. Citizens for Free Kuwait donated $50,000 to the Congressional Human Rights Foundation after Iraq invaded Kuwait. 
a dramatic... Congressman John Porter, co-chair of the Human Rights Caucus and now honorary co-chair of the Human Rights Foundation. The contributions that, uh, that uh, came later from uh, Citizens for Free Kuwait, I think, were, were uh, given because uh, they felt we had, uh, by holding the hearing and, and allowing the American people to hear uh, some of the atrocities going on in Kuwait, uh, were, were helpful toward their goal of, of ultimately freeing uh, their country from uh, the Iraqi invaders. And Hill and Knowlton's connections don't just lead to the Human Rights Foundation, but straight into the White House. Handling the Kuwaiti account for Hill and Knowlton was Craig Fuller, chief of staff for George Bush when he was the vice president. Fuller attends domestic uh, meetings, lunch meetings at the, at the White House in the fall, at least one meeting, where, po where policy uh, in the Gulf is discussed. In fact, public relations policy, because the meeting that Fuller goes to is all about how Bush can sell the war more effectively. Hill and Knowlton Washington has circulated this material as the International Communications Council for Citizens for a Free Kuwait. To help sell the war, America's largest PR company entered the news business. Serve in, in Congress and the... There were daily newscasts and tempting sound bites. Saddam Hussein is uh, better be worried that if he starts something, we're going to finish it. Diplomacy alone rings hollow. Prayers. That we pray for the peoples of Kuwait who are suffering very bitterly. Reports from the front. This is Amal Hamouda reporting from Saudi Arabia. Brought to the heartland by Hill and Knowlton. Saddam Hussein was probably defeated in Kuwait before the American troops got there by the public relations campaign that persuaded the American people to send them. Now I do hope that through you and through our friends in the United States, we can all find somehow any measures for rescuing my people. took the incubators and left the children to die on the cold floor. When you look back in retrospect, the things that stand out in your mind are some of those pictures, some of those images, some of those stories. And you think that, in fact, there was uh, 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 the kind of outcome we wanted to happen, happened. schoolgirl and her story shocked an audience that extended far beyond the hearing room. While I was there I saw the Iraqi soldiers come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of the incubators, took the incubators and left the children to die on the cold floor. Would you let us talk to the one eyewitness we've been able to find who's your daughter? Would you let her tell her story to us about what she saw? I believe there is no reason why she told it to the whole world. 